Come on, shoot him. He's not going to shoot him. He might let us shoot him. Okie dokie. He's going to record. Okay. Oh, good, there's not a microphone. <laughs> I'm an alcoholic. My name's Susan. And I'm from Coates, North Carolina. My home group is the Steps to Recovery group. And um, I've been a member of that group for a long time. It's actually the second group I've ever been a where I've ever been a member. And the first one uh, fell apart after I quit being Mother Superior or something. I don't know. They just never did anything unless I did it. And I got mad and left. And then they didn't have me anymore. So. Um, I learned a lot from that, and one of the things I learned is that I'm not that important. I'm really not, and I don't know where I'm going with all this, other than I was thinking about this on the way over here today. I started getting anxious and nervous and, you know, all the things. I don't think I'll ever not do that, and that's okay. And I thought, well, you're not all that. <laughs> What's the big deal? You've got a story. You've got a experience to share, and, um, and that's all you have. And when I try to have more than that, I get in trouble, and sometimes I get other people in trouble, too. So um, my sobriety date is January the 1st, 1989, uh, New Year's Day, but that had nothing to do with it other than I got in a fight with my husband about which meeting we were going to go to the night before and went out and got drunk because he didn't go where I wanted him to go. But um, I hadn't gotten sober then, and he had just gotten sober. so. It was a risky thing for me to do. I'll tell a little bit more about that later because it is a part of my story. I really am surprised about the years that I've been sober. When I would hear somebody say they had one, two, three, four, five, it would just impress me. I would just think, oh boy, I have it all together by then or all the things that I need to know now. And I have to tell you, every day is different. Every day is an adventure. Um, I just have to find what is necessary for me to do to stay sober and to walk a little closer with my higher power and to help others. And I'm not a major spiritual person. I just do what's in front of me and try to stay connected to my higher power, my group, my girls, my sponsor. And I try to keep it simple because I am so complicated. On the way over here tonight, I had my old GPS, my new phone, printed out direct. I got so lost. And because she kept saying we lost connection to the internet, and I thought, well, what am I supposed to do now? So, plus, it was a different way than I've ever been before, and I, I'm going to have to get directions back to my, my <coughs> truck, my husband's truck, because I have no sense of direction. I can do a floor plan, I can design something, I can paint something, but I cannot tell you how to get out of here and get back to my truck. That's just not there. I think it um, makes my life, and everyone else is very interesting. So. I have, always have adventures wherever I go, but I know I'm going to get lost, and so I don't get really too upset about it unless somebody's waiting for me. And I try to always give myself plenty of time. I don't always. Tonight I thought I did, and I just did. So that's something that I'm, that I'm aware of every day, that that's a, that's a problem, and I have to be aware of it and deal with it. I'm trying to think what I could say that might help, especially a new person, because when I would go to speaker meetings, and still when I do, in the very beginning especially, I'd sometimes I'd just be hanging on, wondering whatever, you know, and then if I listened, which I've learned to do here, thank goodness, I would usually hear something that would help me, motivate me, inspire me, keep me connected, whatever just enough. And sometimes I'd just be transformed almost in my mind after I heard somebody. So I think it's real important when I chair a meeting, when I talk to someone, when I speak, that I, that I try to stay with my experience and what worked for me because I think that's what always reached me. I remember before I got sober sneaking into AA meetings from the back Trying to, trying to figure out, do I belong there? I don't think many people who don't belong there do that, but I was trying to figure it out because, you know, if I did belong there, I had to quit drinking, and I just wanted to find something else besides quitting drinking. It terrified me to think about it. But I kept going, and I kept being AA and around AA, and people in my family were getting sober, and it was just the most amazing thing in the world. It was sort of like I was being funneled <laughs> into the program. And the last night I drank and came home the next day, my husband had been sober 
about three weeks. It was January 1st, he got sober December 8th. I knew the gig was up and, um, and I really did have a decision to make because up until then I'd managed to fool myself, denial, whatever you call it, deluse, I was delusional, that's what my, my friend says, that I, that I really wasn't an alcoholic and yet my whole life was in pieces. My brain was gone, my, my emotions were, I don't know what, I didn't even have any, I just had feelings. And um, I stood to lose all the things that I thought were important to me that I thought if I ever had back, I wouldn't need to drink. Well, I did have them back. My husband was sober. I'd come home, I'd left him and several months before because he was a problem. And when I, when I left, I discovered, I'm doing this out of order, but it doesn't matter, it's what I'm supposed to do, that I could not not drink. I always thought I had to because of my situation. You would drink too if you lived with a guy I lived with or you had my high pressure job or I don't know, you had my dad. It doesn't matter, just pick it. And the way I drank, I had to really work hard to have good reasons to drink the way I drank. I didn't just have a couple of glasses of wine every night. I knocked them back, hard liquor straight. Not that that's important, but that's just, you know, normal people don't do that because they had an alcoholic father or a, an addict husband or I didn't meet their sales quota or did meet their sales quota. I mean, that's just how I was. And I didn't see that as alcoholism. And when I began to, it scared me so badly. I thought, well, I'll just not drink. And when I couldn't do that, and when I was drinking things I didn't even like, uh, and hiding the phone at night, because I wouldn't live at home anymore. I found a place in Fayetteville to live for a while. And, Hiding the phone at night so I wouldn't call people, or hiding my keys so I wouldn't drive, and wake up the next day and I'd found the phone and called. My sister would be hysterical. My car would still be out there, sort of. And I thought, you know, I need to cut back. <laughs> I need to cut back. So anyway, it took what it took to get me here. And being, as a lot of us are, just absolutely do it my own way, defiant. Don't take anything that I like away from me. You don't have the right I deserve to do what I want to do. That was just self-centeredness, alcoholic selfishness to the extreme, and I didn't see it then. Every day I discover, or I see, I don't discover because I know, something about myself that's either, oh, really, or hey, yeah, that's pretty good, because I'm paying attention now. And we talk about doing a tent step every night. I think that's great for me to keep sober, but the wonderful thing about that is it's really not a lot of trouble because I'm able to do it. I don't just fall out every night or go to sleep or, pa or whatever, pass out, and just start over again the next day. I actually learned something that day. <laughs> I actually can use what I learned or did or didn't do, or I can grow from that, or I can help somebody from that, or I can just live better tomorrow. And, um, and more and more I'm appreciating how important that is because life is short. Just lost a 50-something year old brother-in-law just dropped dead four days ago. That's where Steve is tonight. Just dropped dead in Alabama. He's down there now. Uh, no really indications that that was gonna happen. I have my best friend who lost her first husband and I'm not remodeling tonight. I'm just gonna tell you why these things reach me now and not to make a big deal out of it. It's just the way life is. But um, her husband's just been diagnosed with stage four lung bone cancer, metastasized. We just found it out last week. He's in his 50s. It's her second husband. Her first one dropped dead of a heart attack. And um, I mean, who knows? So I want to have a good time. That's all I ever want to have. And I, I know I can't do it with a hangover, hurting myself and others. But I have found such happiness in so many areas that I was never even aware of. And you know, you can give a baby, I've got this really precocious little great-grandnephew, he's like two now and he's already, his mother's teaching him baby read or something, I don't know, but he's really smart and he can do things that I couldn't do at seven. But you know, even then he doesn't know what he's doing. And so we have to learn what we're doing. I had to learn what we're, I was doing. And I would come to meetings and I'd be in so much pain. You know how we are, we're just like, oh my God. 
Miss Drama Diva and didn't know it and hated somebody else who was a drama diva and you know they just shut up I could say what was going on with me and well I'm not so much that way anymore but I heard something on a tape one time in the beginning and the question was when is the last time you felt joy I was walking I, I tried to walk every day back then I do something else now and the, my knees buckled because I thought I don't know. I don't think I have. And that's all I ever wanted, that euphoria, that just instant moment of being okay, happy, joyous, whatever it was that that, that alcohol gave me. And then the next thing that's, that's, and I think about that almost every day, I write about it, what did I find joy in? And if I didn't, I have to find it. I better. The other thing is, what am I in awe of? You know, I think I need awe. <laughs> AWE in my life and and I didn't know that up until recently when I was doing some work and that word kept coming up and I thought you know I've always been a person who really thrives on oh yeah you know this is beautiful new exciting whatever and I have to have that but it's not up to you I always thought it was up to you or liquor or something to give that to me and so I'm beginning to learn what I need and to find it in a healthy way and I don't know why I'm saying all this other than this just is my experience. Because when I got here, I was one miserable, unhappy, selfish, determined young woman. Well, I was 40, but I was still young, actually. If you're, if you're, if you're not that age, that really is pretty young. And, um, and I had had two marriages. I was in my second marriage. I'd had a good, interesting life. I'd been to school. Uh, my first husband and I were stationed all over and put him through Air Force and graduate school. And, um, and I kept thinking, okay, when this is this, I'm going to be happy. When we're through with school, out of the Air Force, when we're back home from Germany, when we have some money, have a house, have a new car, have enough money to buy groceries. You know, I was buying macaroni and cheese at the PX for nine cents a box in Germany back then, and if you can believe that. And I mean, it was just such a struggle, but I tell you what, I was pretty happy. I wasn't drinking then, not a lot. And um, somewhere along the line, I did start drinking. And I think I did it just like I did a lot of drinking. I did it out of resentment and anger, and I'm gonna get you back. Because my first husband loved to drink. We got together drinking. It was so attractive to me. My dad was an alcoholic, died of it actually after 30 years in the Air Force. He died in 73. He was 53 years old. And um, by then I was married and living in um, Auburn, Alabama. I was in school there. My husband's in school there. And he was in Seattle, Tacoma in the Air Force, whatever that hospital is up there, military hospital. He was dying of alcoholism. He was the color of that that gentleman's shirt right there. And I went up with my, to see with my mother and they've been separated a long time. And I, you know, I, I hate to say this, but I hated that man. I thought my life would have been so much different if he had been the dad that I thought everybody else had. Well, guess what? Not many people have that dad. I just thought they did. Or that mom either. I had a good mom. But um, I didn't even go to his funeral. I was so full of anger and rage in him. And what I came to realize later is that's just who he was. And that um, he couldn't help that any more than I could. And later on I made amends to him even after he died. I'll tell you a little bit about that because it changed me. So I um, stayed mad at my husband all the time because he spent whatever little money we had on, on booze and going out to the club and that just like my dad did. And so one day when I was working in downtown Minneapolis, I graduated and was working there and he was in graduate school still, endlessly in graduate school, he finally finished. Pete would come over to get me late at night and I was getting off work and he would been across the street to the bar, one of the bars, he said, you want to come? We we're having a nice time. And I said, no, no, we don't have the money to, and one night I said, okay, I went across the street to a bar called Ichabod's. And that was when I became a daily drinker. That was in 1976. And I never stopped unless I had to. I worked, I did well, I was very successful. I finished my degree. I probably couldn't have done that because I was studying design, so I probably couldn't have done that drinking. I got a lot of good jobs. I continued to work because he was continuing in school. We came to, to North Carolina in 79 and um, 
got a job at State in a lab, and I got a really highfalutin sales job, and I thought if I ever had that kind of job, I'd be happy. I'd be Miss It. You know, I was buying those women's magazines that talk about how powerful we are. And a lot of you remember Cosmo. Well, that was my Bible. And I had no other view of what I was supposed to be. I didn't know who I was. I thought I did. My plan had always been never to marry until I was like in my 30s or 40s, pick just the right guy, and never ever be dependent on anybody because that, that way lay heartbreak. So the only example I had of being in control of your life was my father. He was just wicked. <laughs> he was handsome, charming, a drunk, very successful in his career. But he was never there, and he did whatever the heck he wanted to. And we all revolved around it. Y'all know that. And so I, was, I guess I didn't know it, but that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be in charge of me. And sometimes I still want to be in charge of me. Um, I grew up in church, Sunday school. Went to a Baptist girls' school my first year before I got married. And I've learned that none of that means anything. When I was little, it meant something. And then as I got older, I could not live and think that way and still drank and did the things I was doing. Because the more I drank, the more things I did, and the more things I did, the more I had to drink. Because I was a married woman, and I was traveling on um, my company's money, and I wasn't always using my time um, productively, because I'd be too sick, or not sick, but hungover. So anyway, um, when I got married the first time, I was in school, and my plan had been to be in school until I got my degree, find some kind of wonderful, incredible career, and just have the life. I don't know what it was going to be. I went through all kinds of ideas, but I went off to school. And um, in no way was I going to compromise that, because I didn't want to end up waiting for a check from the military every month like my mother did. She was working and trying to raise me and my sister. So I met this guy who was about five years older than I was. He was a blind date from a friend of ours, and we all went out and we drank that night and had a good time. And I really liked him. I mean, he was, we got along great. He was very intelligent, we would have to talk about everything and drink. And I thought it was so cool that he would bring enough beers to have one the next morning. When he woke up, he'd sleep in his car so he could see me first thing. I'd sneak out and meet him. But that was so cool to me. 18 years old. So anyway, I went off to school and he called me. The, the war was, the Vietnam War was going on. And he called me, he'd been um, shipped off to basic training in Texas to Air Force, because otherwise he knew he'd be drafted and probably die in Vietnam. And he said, when I get out, we're going to get married. Now, everything up until then was, oh, no, no, no marriage for me. I thought, school was hard. It was hard to make enough money to survive there, buy art supplies. I had a scholarship. It was not nearly enough. And so I said, plus I didn't like one of my roommates. And I said, um, okay. So we got married in June, and I had a year of school. And it was um, almost 10 years later before I went back and finished. But that's how easily I would change my mind, because it'd be just too hard. It'd be too hard. So I made up for it by being diligent in a lot of other ways, which helped me in, in a lot of ways. And that let me survive drinking for many years and still do pretty well. So I married this guy, and um, he didn't stand a chance with me. It's a long time. I mean, we were married over 16 years when I met the guy that, <laughs> he, uh, the Pope, as he called him tonight, when I met Steve. And um, we had this, finally this wonderful little house, brand new house in a subdivision in Raleigh, new truck, new car, good job. I got a good job. We finally had the puppy. And um, I mean, God, it was just great. Except for, I was just mad all the time. <laughs> Nothing pleased me. I was unhappy. I was restless, irritable, and discontent. And I was drinking then. He was too, but not, you know, I, I got to where I way out drank him. And there was so much, you know, one of the things I discovered is I expected most of my relationships to give me something that I never had growing up. I don't know why I expected that. I never even was able to, to say that until later on and I realized with step work, that somehow or another you owed me something. And if that first few minutes of euphoria with you and that happy whatever it is we have with a new person wears off and reality comes in, you say something about my drinking or 
whatever, it's over. It's over. You're not giving me exactly what I need, and I'm going to move on. That's crazy, especially when you're married. It took me years to, to begin to do that after I was married. But anyway, um, I would stay after work with a lady who became my sister-in-law later. She's gone now. She had cancer and died. She's the husband of the sister of the husband, my husband now, Steve. Um, the Pope is what I was called. But she scared me, but she also attracted me because my whole life I had pretended to be, you know how we do, we want to be what we think we ought to be so that nobody will say anything to, well, somebody will say anything to me about my drinking or saying, are you drinking a little too much or why are your eyes red or you just got, I just had to be perfect. That's a lot of work <laughs> to do that. Um, paint your nails in the morning shaking because you were too drunk to do it the night before. And it's just crazy stuff that probably men can't relate to. Maybe shaving you can. But there was this beautiful little buxom, blonde, bouncy hair, five foot tall, dressed in a suit like Dynasty in front of our boss's desk right after I started work there in Raleigh in an office supply store. I was selling design services. She was selling everything else. Just a design, I don't know. She just was a really good salesperson. And she was literally up and off the floor ranting and raving at him because she was displeased about a delivery or something. And I looked at her and I thought, I wish I could do that. Because I never did. I just smiled and drank, smiled and drank. And um, stayed mad all the time, madder and madder and madder. And so she didn't like me. I sort of was invading her territory with all those other men salespeople. But eventually she decided she would capitulate and she, we became really good friends. And we traveled together. She'd con the boss into paying her way to Chicago for market and stuff. And I cannot believe I didn't die up there. The insanity was we would go out, and that was when discos were big in the, in the early 80s. And if you missed that, I'm sorry, because it was really fun for a while. <laughs> but um, we would go out, and both of us married. And I'd come out of some place on, on Rush Street and get in. If there was a limousine out there, somebody said, like, I'd just get in the limousine. We'd go off, the whole party of us. Nobody ever hurt me. I'd call her the next day. I'd have some way to tell her where I was, and she'd come get me in a cab, and there we'd go. It's amazing. It's just amazing. I was just really blessed. And there are so many little memories I have of my drinking. I would start out the night before, we'd get all fixed up and dressed up, go shopping the day before. We were supposed to be in market, but we didn't, we didn't do that. And just want to look the part, you know? And the next morning, I would be so sick and messed up that nobody even knew who I was. She sent her, one of her friends to find me one morning to go to the airport, and he couldn't find me. She, he said, what happened to her? So, but what, two of my memories of that, and these are so small, but they're so important to me, is I was kind of passed out in the bed at the hotel one morning, and the door opened, it was housekeeping, and the lady came in, and housekeeping, and then she went, looked around, I guess she looked around, I don't know, I didn't see her, I had the covers over my head, and she said, Lordy, 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 and slammed the door, and we didn't see her. And getting on the elevator one morning about 7.30 from wherever I had been, and having all those beautiful business people dressed up, step back. And I was thinking, it's all right, I'm fine. So I lived such a stupid life, and yet I said I was having fun. And of course it meant I lied and did all that kind of stuff. I'm just telling you this to tell you that I didn't know any other way to live other than not drinking and very unhappy and angry or just doing everything I could that I thought would make me feel good, including drinking and spending money, and luckily I, was, I, I survived that. Of course, it destroyed my marriage, and, um, you know, I just could never figure out why I didn't feel like I thought you felt, why I didn't have, even when I was little, I, can, I don't know where this came to me. I had a box of something the other day in cellophane, and I was unwrapping it, and it reminded me, of Easter one time, when I was little, I don't even know how small I was, Mother would go to all the trouble to have our Easter baskets. And I'd be so excited, chocolate and candy. And went to, went to Sunday school one morning, and some little kid had a whole package of candy eggs in a box wrapped with a ribbon around it, and I didn't have one. My whole day was ruined. I remember being mad about that, and I was tiny. So I was absolutely on my way here. Thank God I'm an alcoholic, or there's no telling what would happen to me. I'd be off the deep end somewhere, because at least I had to have a way to get out of that or die. 
And I bet you one thing, that if somebody came to my best friend's husband and said, you go to a meeting every day, you work with a sponsor, you help others, and you try to live a good life, and your cancer's gone, you won't die from that, what he would do. And you know that's what we've got. It just hit me how important it is for me to remember that. You know, I'm not hurting right now from anything I used to be. My life has gotten pretty good. I've known a lot of people relapse after my amount of sobriety because it's good and you forget. And um, we've got the same deal. We have people coming to us, almost begging us to say, come to a meeting, let me help you. It helps me to help you. And we may or we may not. I went through a few of those phases. It's so simple because I know, I have learned by watching people that I'm going to die. I'm going to die. A horrible death. And I'm old enough now to see what happens to women as they get older and start drinking. It's ugly. <laughs> of course, it's not ugly when you're younger either. I mean, we just fall apart and nobody wants to take care of us anymore because we're over it. So, um, you know, that doesn't work anymore. It's just my story. But anyway. I was restless, irritable, and discontent from a small child, and I pretended that everything was fine, and I wore my little Sunday school clothes, and I pretended to be good, and I made good grades, and I did this and that, and worked hard, and was a great employee, and made all my quotas, and inside I wanted to kill somebody all the time. All the time. There was a time when I was coming through Campbell tonight, and there's, there's a roundabout and a crosswalk, and you know, you're going on the Air Force, if anybody looks as if they're going to cross the street, you stop and you wait. Well, these kids were crossing and I, and I slowed down and stopped. God behind me honked at me. I guess he wasn't expecting me to stop. I don't know. Well, everything in me wanted to just kind of go two miles an hour all the way through campus. Campus, that sounds like a small thing, but I thought, why would you do that? That's crazy. You don't, you're not that person anymore, but I still am at some point, obviously. So I, every day it takes, and if I had a tonight, I would have thought, oh, why'd I do that? So, but if you know anybody with Captain Kirk on their license plate, that's the guy. So, <laughs> pretty white car, I thought. You know, I, I think that um, the good thing is I was sober and not hungover, and I saw those kids. That's what I had to think about. Anyway, I was a mess. Didn't know what a mess I was. I was headed for all kinds of trouble. Didn't know just how bad I had. Every time I read about somebody going to prison or hurting someone or whatever it is we do drinking, I'm so sorry for the people they affected. But I'm also so sorry for them because I know without a doubt that it is by God's grace that I haven't done anything tragic like that. Just, just destroying two families when I left my first husband was enough for me. That was a horrible thing I did, and I never thought twice about it because what happened was Steve, the Pope, came along, and um, I've been married, I guess, 16, 17 years, and Anne's sister, I mean, um, my sister-in-law, Anne, said, my brother-in-law's just in jail, and he, I can tell you this because he's already probably told you, he's in, in jail in Atlanta, and he's going to come up here, and we're going to try to help him. Would you like to meet him? We'll go out to bow ties. Tuesday night. Well, my husband was out of town. I said, you know, I love bow ties, of course. And I've heard about this guy. This wild and crazy guy lived on the beach. Nut. Just absolute hippie nut. Well, that sounded attractive to me because I'd always had you know, college professors and businessmen and all that kind of stuff. Well, I got in the back of her little Cadillac that night. And I say that because it was a little gold Cadillac and she was a little gold person, <laughs> you know, and he got in there and he probably weighed 110 pounds. He had long blonde hair like that, Fu Manchu mustache, red, white, and blue eyes, and he, and I, man, I, we were all fixed up. We went to bow ties that night, which is where we have all of our stuff at the Hilton now. It's, it's called the box, um, box, whatever, the little deli, a little um, diner now, but anyway. It was a great disco back then. Good music, crazy, crazy. And he turned around. I don't always tell this, but I don't tell it too much. He turned around, and I was back here, and he was up in the front seat, passenger, and he winked at me. He'd never seen me before. And I was a goner. Now, he was wild looking. He said, Whatever you want to do is fine with me, baby. Let's get some booze and go. And I'm thinking, Oh, man, <laughs> this is great. And uh, I never knew that I would run off in a couple weeks from my husband, my wife, my dogs, my job, 
getting my brand new big beautiful car my company had bought me and we just ran off moved into a little triplex on Athens Drive with no furniture steel case file cabinet because I was able to do that never said anything to anybody my mother was hysterical I wasn't drinking the whole time either I called my husband one day I was with him and, and his sister and I said, I'm going to be late coming home today because nobody can tell me what to do. And he said, well, you're always late coming home. And I said, you know, I'm just not coming home. And I didn't ever come home again. Um, I had to make amends except to get a few things, a few things. And I, I still don't have, I don't know where a lot of stuff is. But um, all my silver from my grandmother and my great-grandmother, all that, so I don't know where that is. Um, just little things. And I stayed mad at my former husband about that. You can believe it. So anyway, I did a lot of damage, and it was very, very hard later on when it was eighth and ninth step time to do that. Fourth step wasn't that bad. This step was hard, but the eighth and ninth step was the eighth step was really something. So anyway, um, speed this up a little bit. We walked and rolled along, and I finally thought I was happy. I tell you what I did. I stayed home on Athens Drive every night, walked a big black chow brushed him, walked him around Johnson Lake, drank gin, dressed up every night for Steve to come home, cooked these incredible meals for him, and we'd get drunk and pass out, and he'd get up and do it the next day. I, I left my job, my dream job, was out of touch with everybody. I had no friends anymore, I just cut them all off. Because how do you do that? How do you leave and lose everything and pretend everything is okay? and take the risk that people are really going to see how you're living because then you have to see how you're living. We moved down to Coates. There's some land we bought down there and I thought, okay, this is going to be it. This is great. I got another job. He started a business. And every single day was pure hell. And you know, I hear people get up and tell their stories and don't talk about much about relationships. They talk about work and school and sports and that's fine. My whole life has been about relationships good and bad and what they can do for me and now what I can do for them. And, and I have always been, I guess you'd call it codependent, I don't know, but I always need something from you if, if you're my spouse or my friend. And I've had to really be aware of that, especially because <clears throat> that's not a husband's job. <clears throat> and when your second husband starts saying the same things to you, your first husband does, it's time to pay attention. Um, <clears throat> like, we're not on a date, we're married, you know, that kind of stuff. So. Um, I had a lot of growing up to do. My niece is a beautiful, brilliant artist, singer, librarian, and she does a lot of Facebook stuff, which I don't. And my sister called and she said, you know what Melinda put on her Facebook page? And I said, no, what? And she said, she had a real difficult situation at work and home, and she wrote, I need an adult for this, to help me with this. And then she said, oh, I am a adult, an adult. And then she said, I need somebody more adultier. Well, I've always needed somebody more adultier for me because I don't think that way. I think about what's going to feel good, what's going to be easy, or I used to. I don't anymore. I've learned not to because it's not easier, really. So anyway, I ran off with him. We got married after a lot, a lot of bad stuff, and I'm married anyway. I got another job. I always got a good job. He went to Raleigh. I went to Fayetteville and worked, which was great because I, I had an office. I didn't have just where I would go and do stuff that I was supposed to do, like paperwork, which I never did until they almost fired me and then I did. But um, I worked down there and did okay, he did okay, and every night when I was coming home, you, there's a curve coming from Coates down our, our little country road. I would go around that curve and part of me was going, oh, I have a drink, and the other part was going, absolute terror, what's going to happen tonight? what is going to happen tonight because some nights it was really bad until one last night when I came home I'd been to an Alamo meeting because I thought that was going to solve everything because <laughs> he had some real problems um, not worse than mine I always thought he did but he did and I came home and he was drinking and I, and I knew I needed if you've ever been in that situation I hope you haven't but especially as a woman if you've ever been in that situation where you just know you need to get the heck out of there well, I did, and I was prepared. My sister-in-law kind of prepared me to have some money, have, and I ran away. I got my what I, little bit I had, and I ran away, and I rented a place in Fayetteville just because the address was my birth year before he even went in it, so I'd have a place. I was insane, still trying to work, and then I really started drinking. 
I'd never had a lost weekend before where I didn't remember the weekend. Well, that started there. So anyway, um, I kept thinking if he were going to get sober and clean, I could come home and I would be okay. It always hinged around what somebody else did. I would drive all the way up there from Fayetteville in Coates in about an hour to drive by where we lived to see if it looked as if he were alive. And if the lights were on, he'd already moved the woman in there, you know how we do. If the lights were on and the grass was mowed, I'd get really mad because he didn't really miss me. And if the lights were off and the grass were high, I'd go, oh, he's dead. I mean, it was crazy. And it made perfect sense to me until I finally told my sister-in-law, do not mention his name. It was like a drug for me. If I would hear about him one way or another, I'd go crazy and I'd need another fix. I never did drugs. I was too old when they all got into all that stuff. But anyway, I was long gone from school, but I'm so glad. I'll chew a whole pack of gum in five minutes. I mean, if it's good, give me all I want. So anyway, eventually I got a call from her and she said, I have to tell you this, Steve's gone to detox. He did, and he got sober. They had an AA meeting they carried over there. He met his first sponsor. So I came on home, all victim, uh, right at the end of the year, and started moving my stuff. Of course, we fought all the time because we had never learned to do anything but drink and other stuff and fight. And so the New Year's Eve, we fought about what meeting we were going to go to. I wanted to go up with my sister-in-law. She had gotten in recovery. She was in Almond, and her drunk husband, the worst drunk I'd ever known, had gotten sober. And I spent a little time with them, and that's what led me to the program, because I could not believe their life. I thought they were trying to pull one over on me or something. Their filthy, nasty, screwed-up home was that moved. It was beautiful and clean. They had all kinds of program people, smell of coffee, went from Marsalis on the stereo, and it was like, hello, who are these people? And I thought, well, I could never have that. And you know, when I went to meetings, and sometimes still, I would hear people say these most amazing things, like straight from the promises. And I think, yeah, I'm going to try that, do that, but I don't know how to do it. You have to show me. And so I would just get frustrated because I thought, well, I know this. Why can't I do it? Why, I, why can't I turn it over, let it go, give it to God, let him go? First things first. Well, it takes a lot. It's like, this is the alphabet, read. Well, I had to have somebody teach me. But it was possible. And the first time I heard the promises read, I was just maybe even barely, if even sober, I fell completely apart because that was exactly the life that I'd always wanted. And it was right in my face like somebody slapped me. Well, most of them are, are in existence for me now. It's incredible. Um, anyway, he got sober. I got drunk. I picked up a white chip very reluctantly the night before, that next night. <clears throat> stayed with my sister-in-law at Melba's, it's no longer there, and I started resentfully, reluctantly not drinking. I'm not going to say getting sober, but I was just determined enough to do what you said to do. I got a sponsor, like five right away. If I called and she was busy, then I'd get mad and not call her back again. I'd go get me another one. And, uh, and you had to do everything just right for me, or I'd just like off with your heads. So I got sober and by not drinking. That's really what I could say until it began to do the things. And I worked with a sponsor, and I did work the steps. And I still, I'm going through them again. I'm on the eighth step. Again, um, write about it every day, do my stuff. And I used to resent that, but now it, it means so much to me. It helps me so much. It's enabled me to establish a conscious contact with a God in my understanding, which has not been easy because I rejected all that. Just didn't have, I felt so less than when I would think about it. I don't like that phrase, but that's what I felt. So anyway, <clears throat> my precious time, I'm, I'm sort of retired. I never really have been because I'm an artist now. And I'm, I, I get, if I get mad about anything, it's because I can't go out to my job. But um, I, I'm busy. Last night, I stayed up all night, and I put together a table, a desk, a glass and, and metal desk with an Allen wrench. I've never used an Allen wrench before, but you've got to use the right end of the Allen wrench, or you'll be 6 o'clock in the morning getting the thing together. But I did it. And used to, I would have been drunk. And now I can do a lot of stuff, but I've never been able to do that. And I actually had to follow directions to do it. And I had all the pieces, and I used all the screws. So that's a big deal for me. It's one of the little things. So anyway, I did my steps. I did a fourth step. I did a fifth step. I was scared to death. I didn't give it to my sponsor. I gave it to her sponsor. And she told me after that, she said, I'll forget it. Just don't worry about it. So I talked about 
the dishonesties, the sexual things, the infidelities, all that stuff. I went ahead and talked about that. And then I began to make a list of my character defects. I didn't just whip them out. We had to look at every single one of them and how it affected me and others. So I could obtain knowledge about myself from them, as it says. And then I went on to make an eight-step list. And the beauty of that step for me was that I learned to forgive under penalty of death. I had to forgive my father. I had to forgive everybody. And it was very hard. It took a lot of, God, please help me, to the point where I went to his grave in Tennessee, and I told you guys I have no sense of direction. Steve and I went to Nashville, National Cemetery, and I went to the kiosk there, and they told me kind of where the grave was, because you know, they're all the same. And I got out of his truck with my little flower, and I don't know what I thought was gonna happen, I was scared of death. Out by myself, and I walked over to the grave, and I knelt. And I prayed and I asked him to forgive me for my hatred and my just what evil, evil thoughts about him and resentment. And I want to tell you guys, this was like something out of a movie where you see a spirit. It was unbelievable because I felt the first freedom I'd ever really felt in my life, except for when I took that really good first drink and that sort of marble clicked into that wheel. And I, for the first time, I felt okay. Well, I felt that again. And I realized it had, that had affected everything in my life. You know where it says under, underlaying resentments can still rule, ruin our lives or whatever in the eighth and ninth step? Well, that one had. It had ruined my first marriage. It was going to ruin my second one. It prevented me from bonding with people the way I needed to. And it was only after that, sitting on my front porch with a girl I sponsored who was whining about the same thing again. She woke me up early one sitting there just going, God, do I have to listen to this? And then all of a sudden, I felt this incredible affection and love for her and compassion. I'd never felt that before, but the beauty of that was that I knew you had felt it for me. I never really believed it. So that was a miracle. And had I not made that amend, and I've made, I think, all my amends. I called my aunt today, and I realized I hadn't talked to her in so long. And she was so glad to hear from me. And I was almost scared to call her because I was embarrassed. But I did. And I'm so glad I did. Who am I just to go, well, I don't feel like doing that. When I could really reach out to somebody I love and loves me. So anyway, it's a work in progress. I'm glad it is. Um, I'm glad I'm not the same person. I couldn't be the same person I was. I'm not the person that I hope to be. It doesn't matter. I'm doing what I need to do, I think, with a sponsor's direction. I have a new sponsor now, um, somebody I've known for a long time, been sober a long time, and we are spiritually connected. We both have the same higher power, and um, it's just different. Um, I believe I have to have somebody I can tell anything. You know, if I want to slap your face or kick you in the bottom, I need to have somebody, or spit at you even, I need to have somebody I can tell without worrying about what they're going to think about me. I don't care what you think about me if, if, it's a, if you're the kind of person I can talk to because I have to talk about that stuff or at least tell you that stuff if not talk about it. Talking about it's only so good. It's what I do about it. I've discovered I tell my sponsor all this cool stuff, all this us stuff, and I feel so much better and then I wouldn't be any better. And she said one day, she said, you better get that fourth and fifth step done. This is the same stuff you talked about six months ago. Well, I was going to fire her, but I didn't, and anyway, that's how it is. It's just every day. Steve is in Alabama, I told you that. Brother-in-law died. My best friend's husband is sick. I've lost my mother, all kinds of family members I love. I don't know how many dogs. We have two new dogs now, a year old. Two romp and stop and little gray and white pit bulls that are absolutely a joy and a pain in the patootie. Um, they make us happy, and I can find joy now. I can find awe now. I can go out to my shop and paint because the program has taught me to know I don't know and to ask, can you help me, which has allowed me to have a whole new career or more than one. I don't know what's next. Because I was able to say to somebody, how do you do that? She said, well, come to my studio. I'll show you. OK. And it launched me into a whole different place in my life. I'm not afraid of anything healthy. I never used to be afraid of anything. I'd go to honky tonks in awful places when I was working on the road and didn't know anybody. I almost got killed a few times. I wasn't scared. I was drinking. Now I do things 
because I know it's going to help me or help somebody or enhance my life or my knowledge. And it's wonderful. I'm embarrassed to tell you, I've always had, I've had a computer for years, but I got an iPad last fall. Oh my God. I can do anything on that thing. And I'm up all night with a little apps and all that stuff. And Steve will get up and go, what are you doing at 3 a.m.? And I'm learning stuff. Got all these classes you can take. I never would have done that. I never would have put a desk together. I'd have been drunk and sick and worried about how I was going to get to work the next day. That alone is the reason that I have a happy life. But I have a wonderful marriage now. We worked hard, a lot of help, a lot of counseling, a lot of love, a lot of steps, a lot of sponsorship. Nobody knew we were married the first two years. He was with his sponsor in his group, and I was with my sponsor in mine. People go, oh, isn't it nice you got sober together? And I said, no, it was not nice. We didn't even speak. Because all that stuff that got us together was the stuff that almost killed our marriage. But it's okay, because sponsorship in the program has changed all that. And I'm so grateful. Because I'm getting older now, and he is too, and we need each other. So he just had shoulder surgery, and I'm glad I was okay to help him. So all I can tell you is, I don't even know what I said, is that I'm happy today. I've never been happy before. Well, I wasn't even happy for a long time in recovery, because I always wanted more than I was getting, and wasn't willing to do as much as I needed to do. But now I am, because it's just so great. It's like having somebody waiting to give you something, and you go, oh, that's too much trouble. I'm not going to walk that far to get it. It's so easy. It's easier to do it than not do it and with the right direction and with the right attraction. And that's what I found important. If you've got it and I like the way you do it and I like your life, then, oh boy, I'm ready. Show me. Let me ask you, how do you do it? I didn't get into service work. It's important. There's no substitute, and I wouldn't be sober today without it, to contribute back. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for service work. So if your sponsor says or your home group says, what are you willing to do? If you don't know, you're not supposed to know. Just ask somebody. That's the key. And um, y'all have a good group here, good group of people, a lot of really good sobriety. And I hope that I said something tonight to contribute to that because I really enjoyed seeing all of y'all. And I know some of you really well, and some of you sort of kind of. But I hope to get to know all of you at some point. And y'all come see us in Coates. We have our anniversary the second Saturday in October every year. It's wonderful. We have good speakers. And if you want more information, we'll get a flyer for you. So we'll see you there. Thank you. Thank you.